how the hell did a relatively young and inexperienced real estate investor take down a two and a half million dollar 42 property portfolio with a six hundred and thirty thousand dollar down payment well it was probably a combination of boldness delusion and sheer force of will that got it over the finish line you don't want to miss this story Welcome to the Mastering Real Estate Podcast. This podcast is for real estate investors and professionals looking to take their real estate game to the next level. Each week, I review the industry's leading real estate books and break down the main lessons that you can apply to your life and business. Then every other week, I review my own personal lessons learned from flipping over 100 houses and being a full-time real estate investor since 2018. Stay tuned each week so that we can all become masters of real estate together. Welcome back to episode 18 of the Mastering Real Estate Podcast. A lot of people in this industry only talk about their successes and wins, but not me. My lessons learned have been hard earned and I want to share them so that hopefully you can avoid some of the mistakes that I made along the way as I learned to become a professional real estate investor. Today, we are talking about projects number nine, through 51, buying a 42 property portfolio and then flipping all of the houses one by one. Before we get into it, I'm your host, Maura McGraw. I've been a full-time real estate investor since 2018. I've managed over 100 flips, founded and grew a real estate investment firm, and I live and work in the real estate industry every day. We have two show formats on this podcast. The first show format is the Real Estate Book Review Show, where I analyze the industry's leading real estate books, pick out the key points, and help you apply the key concepts to your life and business. Then, every other week, like this week, I share some of my personal most important lessons learned from flipping over 100 houses and being a full-time real estate investor for six plus years. The point of the two show formats is for us all to become well-rounded masters of real estate together. We can do this by learning from experts through their books, and hopefully I can add some valuable knowledge in these episodes where I share my own lessons learned from my experience in the real estate industry thus far. Also, we have an awesome YouTube channel where you can watch the video versions of our podcast. You can also see before and after videos of a lot of our projects. Just search for the Mastering Real Estate Podcast or Duratus Properties and you'll find us on YouTube. Subscribe so that you never miss an episode or any of our other content. Today, we are reviewing the biggest real estate deal that I've done in my career thus far, purchasing a 42 property portfolio of single family homes in Birmingham, Alabama. It was the summer of 2019. And at this point, I had been a real estate investor for a little over a year and I had several projects under my belt and I was hungry and looking to take my business to the next level. I was happy doing flips and acquiring rental properties, but I wanted to find a faster way to scale my business and portfolio. So I started looking for small portfolios of properties to purchase and either flip or turn into rental properties. Mostly I was looking at small portfolios between three and 10 houses. Then one of our brokers, Danny, found a portfolio of 46 houses for sale. I am sure that Danny never expected me to want to move forward with a deal of that size. But as I looked at the deal more and more, I started to formulate a plan of how to make it work. Before we get deeper into this crazy story, let's go over some of the basics of this portfolio deal. As far as the address, these were 46 houses scattered throughout Birmingham and the surrounding suburbs. We ended up cutting the portfolio from 46 down to 43 in due diligence, but scattered all throughout the city. Mostly all of the houses were rental properties with tenants already in place. There were a couple that were getting turned over that did not have tenants in place, but the vast majority of them were tenant occupied. The average year built across the entire portfolio was 1966. 
the average square feet of all the properties across the portfolio was 1,600. The average mix of bedrooms and bathrooms throughout the portfolio was three bedrooms, one and a half bathrooms. The year was the summer of 2019, and it took two months for us to close on this property. From finding it, to doing the due diligence, to closing on it, took two months, which for a deal of this size is pretty darn fast. From seeing it, it took us a week or two to get it under contract. And then we had less than 60 days to do our due diligence before closing, which was a really tall order for a deal of this size and for a company like ours that was so young. Anyways, the purchase price for the entire portfolio ended up being two $0.52 0.52 million dollars. Originally they wanted over 3 million, but we were able to whittle that down to about two and a half million dollars. We were able to get an 80% loan to cost loan. Thank God for Bryant Bank and Brian Etheridge for taking a chance on us and helping us make this happen. So that left us with a down payment of six hundred and thirty thousand dollars. We were able to come up with this down payment by by doing two 1031 exchanges for flips that we had in the pipeline at the time. So when we sold those two flips, we immediately put all of the profits into an intermediary and 1031 them to do this deal. We had to raise about $500,000 from private investors for the remaining money. Those are the basics of the deal. Now back to the store. So how the hell did a young and relatively inexperienced real estate investor take down a two and a half million dollar 42 property portfolio with a $630,000 down payment? It was probably a combination of boldness, delusion, and sheer force of will that made it happen in the end. So I had been working with a turnkey company called RP Capital to sell several of my recent flips to others investors, which you've probably heard about in some of my other podcast episodes. From these transactions, I knew that RP Capital had a lot more demand for houses than they could fulfill. So as I looked over the initial portfolio spreadsheet, I began to think that if I bought the whole portfolio at a discount, and sold a good chunk of the properties to other investors through RP Capital, I would be able to repay my investors and probably be able to keep a handful of the properties as rentals for myself. And in the end, this is the general strategy that we pursued. One thing that I learned as I started working on this portfolio deal and as I went on to do more deals in the future, is that there's a lot less competition for portfolios out there. And it's a nice little niche. At the time, most people seemed to be interested in either single family houses or small apartment complexes. And the competition was fierce, especially for those small and medium sized apartment complexes. However, very few people were taking down portfolios. And this is still pretty much true today. These deals are a little hairier. Most banks don't have ready-made loan products for single family portfolios and they require a little more involved due diligence, both on the side of the buyer, but There was definitely an opportunity in this niche and there still is today. If you can figure out how to take down these portfolios and get a lending partner on board, it's a nice little way to carve out a niche as an investor and scale your portfolio pretty quickly. So a big lesson learned of mine as I started to figure out how to do this deal is that portfolios were a nice and far less competitive little niche in the real estate investing space, and they are a good way to scale your portfolio quickly without having to compete with a lot of the big dogs that are going after the apartment complexes. Okay, 
Now let's talk a little bit about the negotiation for this deal. We bought this portfolio from two older gentlemen in the Birmingham area, and the negotiation took several rounds of back and forth meetings and phone calls, and it was intense. And the negotiation did not go at all all how I expected it to go. Leading up to it, I prepared like crazy for this negotiation. I had spreadsheets and numbers coming out of my ears. I prepared these nice little printed books proving my valuations. And in the end, the sellers riff to even look at them. When I gave them the spreadsheets in our initial meeting, they glanced at them and then just set them on the table and never pick them up again. Thank God I had Aziz with me who is a much more adept at the emotional side of negotiations. Luckily, Aziz brought food to the meeting and he started shooting the shit with these guys and appealing to them on a personal level. And this approach worked much better in this negotiation. Eventually, all my numbers and spreadsheets would come into play, and after several days of back and forth, we were finally able to sign an LOI. But really, the majority of the negotiation revolved around getting to know each other, trying to understand each other's motivations and desires, and trying to find a win-win solution for all of us. It's funny to think back on this negotiation because In graduate school, we spent so much time figuring out how to do valuations and various financial models, thinking that these would be the crux of our real estate negotiation. And while those certainly have a place, I have to say that way more of my real estate negotiations have centered around connecting personally with the seller than the numbers or the financial model. Although I had done some small negotiations before this one, This was my first big lesson in the nuanced art of negotiations for bigger deals. And my big takeaway is that understanding the person across the table usually matters a lot more than the numbers and that the emotional aspect of the business negotiation is often just as important and sometimes even more important than the numbers. This leads into my third lesson learned which is fake it till you make it. Throughout this whole deal, I really had to put on a show and make everyone believe that we could do this deal. I had to present myself and our company as a much more established business than we really were in order to get the sellers to believe in us and believe that they could trust us to close on the deal. I also had to make the bank believe that the deal would work. Aziz and I had to undergo the most rigorous financial underwriting process that we've ever experienced in order to make this deal work. And Brian Etheridge, who was the VP, at Bryant Bank at the time really had to go to bat for us with the loan committee several times. That was probably one of the most nerve-wracking aspects at times because we had very limited control over what the bank's loan and investment committee would think or decide. We were extremely dependent on how Brian pitched us. And to be honest, I was a little skeptical about how hard he was going to fight for us, but he did it. And I am forever grateful to him for taking that chance on us. Oh yeah. And we had to raise $500,000 in a very short period of time. So I had to convince my friends and family to take a big chance on me and invest in this project. Finally, and maybe most importantly, I had to make my partners believe that we could do this. Sometimes Aziz and Danny were nervous wrecks during the process and I really had to hold it together and constantly convince them that we could in fact do this deal, even though I secretly sometimes had my own doubts. It felt like one giant performance of fake it till you make it because in reality, we were just a tiny little company and we probably had no business doing a big deal like this. But guess what? It fucking worked. It was stressful, exhausting, and it pushed me to the limits of my creativity and capabilities at the time, but it fucking worked, and we fucking did it. And that is when I really learned that I was unstoppable. Okay, in summary, my key takeaways from this project so far are number one, portfolio deals are a secret little niche that not many people pay attention to, so there's a lot of opportunity there and not much competition. Number two, is the emotional side of negotiations matter just as much as the numbers. Don't ever underestimate it. And number three, fake it till you make it. 
Sometimes you need to act a little bigger than you really are, but that's all part of the game of business. Sometimes you have to step up to the plate and take your swing, even if you know it's a long shot. After all, what's the worst that can happen? I want to take a second to give a quick thanks to our show sponsor, Doradus Academy. We have a bunch of free investor resources, all of our podcast show notes, and an awesome masterclass about how to get started investing in real estate on our website at doradusacademy.com. One really cool free resource that I recommend checking out is our property analysis tool. This is the actual spreadsheet that my team and I use to analyze deals, and you can download it for free on our website. So make sure you check it out at doradusacademy.com. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. This is just part one of this epic saga of taking down this 42 property portfolio. Make sure that you stay tuned for part two, where I discuss the crazy due diligence process, closing, and then flipping all of these houses. Next week, we're diving into Amanda Hahn and Matthew McFarland's book on advanced tax strategies for real estate investors. Last week, we covered their first book, which reviews the tax basics for real estate investors. So I thought that we might as well try to get a little more advanced when it comes to taxes next week. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. We are a new and growing podcast, so every rating, review, and share helps immensely. Also, make sure that you're following us on YouTube and social media. You'll get a lot more behind the scenes and content there daily. See you in the next one.